sounds of Bristol. Watch the welcome. You are in tune to the word here on Ujima Radio. You've got Miranda here through till six o'clock tonight. And I'm really looking forward to introducing my next guests. We are joined by Will and Eloise. Good afternoon, guys. Hiya. How yeah. you doing? Good. Thank you for joining me today. So, Eloise, tell me about what this work is with CYN. So they've got the old court magistrate in Bristol that's been abandoned. Creative Youth Network have now joined Will and I are part of a steering group to make some decisions about where it goes in the future. Hopefully in the next two or three years, we can uh, get it going ready for some creative businesses and some youth workers. It's basically an old building that hasn't really been utilised and you guys are making the decisions on what's going to happen with it. That's so exciting. What we're going to be doing is, well, everything. We're looking at interior design. We're looking at how to promote the space. We're looking at social media postings, what we want to get across, who we're trying to get involved. Yeah, anything that comes down to it, they're looking to us to do it because they want young people to be at the forefront of this project. Tell us, Will, what are you hoping the courts will be a home to? What are we looking at actually physically is going to happen in the building? So we're going to want a creative hub for creative businesses and young people to connect. And that can be done through many different aspects of space. So we want to have an office space for things like, you know, meetings and interviews. We want event spaces and we also want a cafe. We want to put a cafe in there. Once the courts have been all completely refurbished and redesigned, brought back to their original design, it's going to be hopefully a really nice modern space for people to come and just actually relax. So we want it to be like a work environment, but we don't want it to be too formal to the point where you feel like you're actually at work while you're here. So when you say it's a bit in the future, when are you hoping that it will be completed? The aim to be finished and open in 2023. However, we've currently raised 5.5 million, but we still need to raise 1 million before we can actually finish the project completely. We're more estimated to be finished around 2024, but the goal is to be finished and open by 2023. Are you looking to hear some stories about the courts? But yeah, we're basically calling out to see if anybody around Bristol or further out may know anything about the courts, some personal stories, somebody that went there or had a trial there or something that happened, a big event that happened that they remember and that they could possibly share. Again, just they can contact us through the website, the Creative Youth Network website uk. My name is Jake Francisco and we're here in the Old Courts, which is part of the complex of the uh, fire station and um, police station and law courts. Um, and this building used to be a performance space when we had the site as, a, as an arts venue around 2008. Probably one of the most challenging and sort of underused parts of the site, but we did we did do some very special shows in here around themes of justice, um, as well as like Victorian kind of freak spook shows and stuff in the place. Yeah, this was a real kind of um, cohesion point, I suppose, and the biggest space that we'd ever taken on, being like an entire city block. And that's really, really was a melting pot because a lot of people had workspaces and workshop spaces and space for classes and stuff, so people kind of inhabited the space as a bit of a community. But that really. The, and, the, and the carnival show, I guess, was the antithesis of that stuff because it was the fundraiser that opened the rest of the project up. So everybody pitched in, kind of um, like without even really planning it too much, you know what I mean? And it just became this, this huge thing which caught the imagination of, of all the people participating. It had like over 250 cast and crew um, over like three days or something in the end. And yeah, it really kind of caught the imagination of Bristol at the time, I guess, and brought a lot of... I mean, Bristol's always had a really strong creative community, and I think that's blossomed and, you know, and, um, and gone down over the years as well. Because we came in here, um, I think it was Terry that first came down, a guy called Terry, who was, who was um, connected to the youth network. So he came along to a show and was just like, you know, we were going to buy some place out in, I don't know where, but actually we should probably buy this place. So that's another thing is that we sort of, we changed the world, you know, because this would have been a mixed use retail and commercial development. 
you know, whereas now it's a, it's a youth project, which is awesome as well. My name's Inky, I'm a graffiti artist from Bristol in England. Um, I've been painting since 1984. Uh, before that I was into punk rock and video games and um, also cartoons. Uh, then I learned graphic design and since then I've been painting large scale murals, doing screen prints and creating paintings in Bristol. Uh, See No Evil was a project on Nelson Street which we did in 2011 and 2012. It took about two years of planning. Um, I work closely with Team Love, Tom and Dave, who also do a lot of festivals like Love Saves the Day, etc. And a guy called Mike Bennett, who was the council's placemaker for Bristol. Uh, the concept was to take the, uh, dare I say, shittest street in Bristol and turn it into the coolest street on the planet for one weekend. Uh, the first year was such a success, we got Olympic funding for the Cultural Olympiad the next year. And we had around 50,000 people free partying in the middle of the city with art and music and all sorts of stuff and loads of kids' workshops. And then we did an ongoing outreach project of about, I think, 10 to 12 murals around the city, uh, like deprived youth centres or like placed, you know, strategically placed in places where people needed more art in their lives. Um, we also got 72 of the world's finest artists shipped to Bristol who then went off and told the world about Bristol. My connection to this building and the courts, um, apart from coming here for a few parties, was in the 80s. I got arrested for criminal damage a couple of times and driven in through the entrance here into the cells, which was in the police, the old Bridewell police station. And as part of Operation Anderson, I think in the, there were 72 of us arrested in total, which sort of tied in with why we had 72 artists for the Sino Evil project. Um, but they all came through the system here. All, the courts, we actually went to the magistrate's court, which was further down the road, but this is the old Crown Court, which is a much more beautiful building. Mm -hmm. So um, I was brought to the station here, the cells, uh, being arrested for doing mainly tagging. And in those days, we were doing, we, we didn't have permission to paint anywhere, so we would do large scale wall paintings, two or three hour graffitis, and for ca being caught doing those. I think it was me and Nick Walker at the time got brought in there. So when I first moved here in the 70s, Bristol was always a creative city. It was quite shabby and run down and there was a lot of derelict areas, which was obviously pre-war stuff. Um, and it seemed a bit of a backwater to London, so like, you know, if you wanted to get like, you know, some certain materials, you had to go up to London to get it. You couldn't get it, it was like a small town, provincial town. It's massively boomed in the last 30 years or so, and I think partly to do with like, the music scene, the art scene, and the creative scenes blossomed here. Now you've got like Channel 4 and people like that have moved here. But it's definitely taken off. There's always been a massive animation scene in Bristol, so Ardman, like the Bolex Brothers, etc. And I think that's just the people who live here are more kind of artistically inclined. Whereas I think people in London may be a little bit more stressful and kind of more about money. People here are more about a good style of life and making something out of it. Bristol to Bridewell Police Station. Uh, somewhere I got arrested several times in the early 80s as part of Operation Anderson, uh, which was finished in 1989. And we're going to go inside and have a look around. So the Bristol Cut Mars, you've got Virtue and Industrial, which is Virtue and Industry. Well, obviously, it's based around the old ship, saying that this is the old castle, Bristol Castle. Um, I can't remember what the relevance is, but there's something to do with the unicorns have got a massive relevance for Bristol. It does. Are you the top by College Green? They've got the, the top unicorns. of the council house there, but every, if you look everywhere in Bristol, there's unicorns, and there's something to do with merchant venturers and unicorns. I think in the old days, the narwhals horn, which they used to get from the Arctic, they used to think it was a, a unicorn's horn. And I think it was something to do with a lot of sailors had them, so that in Bristol there was a, more, they thought there were more unicorns or something. Mm. Something crazy like that. I always wonder why there was one like my college. Yeah, I can't remember what it is, but it's the arms resting in the snake, and let's see if it's got the scale of justice and stuff. Yeah, that's like the statue of justice that's outside, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. That's on the on top of the door. It's beautiful. It is it? lush, isn't it? And it's really well kept as well. Yeah. So I'm the head of creative at Creative Youth Network and I've been part of the project um, since we bought the building really um, and thinking about how we change that building into a space that's for future generations. So for me, I'm really excited about the fact that it's a historic building um, and it's been used for things in the past. So we've been doing a lot of work with UE and the history department there, so working with students on their MA practice, really looking at the kind of the archives and finding some of the stories about actually what happened in the building when it was the courts, 
both kind of all the way back to when it was a Georgian courthouse right through to kind of more recent history so use of you know it for artists whether it was a squat thinking about circus users we're gathering all that information and it's going to be going into a heritage interpretation project and we're potentially thinking about how we can use digital and different means, so maybe AR or VR, to bring that to life. So once the building's open, people will be able to come in and also experience what that history was through new digital means. So I'm Dr Rose Wallace, I'm Associate Professor of British Social History at the University of the West of England and I have the distinct privilege of being the historical consultant for the Courts Project. I've been involved with the Courts Project since 2018 I think. So I was involved in the bid development phase working with the youth steering group to develop ideas around the heritage of the building to support the initial application which was successful and I've been kept on board, very happy to be kept on board to continue to work with the youth steering group exploring the history of the courts and the ways that we can integrate that creatively into its future. So our magistrates' courts were opened in March 1880 and they promised to be new modern magistrates' courts for the city of Bristol. So magistrates' courts, very much as they are today, deal with complaints, criminal, some civil at a particular level. So this is things that can be dealt with just by magistrates. They don't have juries, unlike the higher courts or crown courts now. But they play a really, really important role socially. So the vast majority of criminal complaints did and do now start and end in a magistrate's court. But they also provide a really important and accessible way for ordinary people to seek justice. So even though we might think of the courts as a regulatory or even oppressive um, organisation, the magistrate's courts was somewhere where ordinary people could bring a complaint, bring a case of something had happened to them, they could seek justice here. And we know that in the first year of our magistrates courts being open, two thirds of the complaints brought here were brought by ordinary Bristolians, people who sought justice. We also understand the courts as a site of social contest. So this is where the magistrates are drawing a line around what's acceptable or unacceptable behaviours in society. That's what courts still do. And we've encountered some cases where that's more explicit, more obvious. So one of the first cases that we found at the beginning of the research process was a seemingly fairly kind of mundane case of a drunken disorderly, a young man um, who was a soldier in the Royal Artillery was arrested in February 1890 um, on a drunken disorderly charge, but also because he was wearing women's clothes. And it's clear that he was treated differently because of this. We also think from the reports that we have, because the policeman didn't know that this was a man dressed as a woman, he thought it was a woman, that this young person would have been dressed quite convincingly as, as a woman. Um, so it probably wasn't just a lark, or that's the kind of sense we get. So there is a question around why they kind of treated him so harshly, and that very much reflects Victorian attitudes to gender and gender identity and absolutely kind of almost zero tolerance to the idea of there being anything beyond the kind of heteronormative understanding of what men and women should be doing and especially because this guy was a soldier the fact that he then chose to dress in women's clothes and go out and have a great time apparently until he got arrested um, it really kind of contravened what was understood to be proper masculinity and um, whereas most people if they got picked up for drunk and disorderly would receive a relatively small fine um, and be sent on their way. He received the most sort of the highest fine, one of the highest fines we've seen, which normally attended drunk and disorderly where there have been some sort of assault. So we can see them coming down on him because he's deviating from those expected gender norms. Uh, Robin Haig, I'm Capital Fundraising Manager for Creative Youth Network and specifically about the courts. If, if you go two miles out anywhere around this building right now, there are some of the most deprived communities in the United Kingdom and in those communities are hundreds and hundreds of young people who have the talent to be in the creative industries, in the creative sector, but have nothing else. And we should be haunted by this. Um, they, they may live in poverty, they may be experiencing discrimination, they may not have done so well at school, they certainly didn't go to the right school. Their parents don't know the right people, so they've got no network. 
they don't have wealth, so personal wealth, so that they can endure, you know, months and years of non-paying internship and work experience work and things like that. And their talents and their ideas, they're being lost to us right now because there isn't a facility like the courts. So their stories, the things they could show us, the different things, the, the, the very diverse pieces of work they could do, whether it's in IT or graphic design or music, theatre, dance, we are missing those people at the moment. And, and, and that is not acceptable. And that's why the courts is really important, because actually it has the scale, the size, to be able to support hundreds of young people per year. The ones with talent, but if you like, not much else to help them, we can support them through that building. So the aim of the courts is to be more for a slightly older age range, uh, probably 18 plus, when the young people are, are looking to really embark in the world of work. So we're hoping that the, the courts will be uh, a workplace where they can tangibly start an apprenticeship, start a traineeship, get some work experience. So what we've been really clear about in our plans for the courts is that this needs to be a place where opportunities are open to all young people, regardless of their background or their circumstances. So inclusivity and opportunity are going to be key to how this building operates. Uh, we obviously will, once we've refurbished it, have an empty building and we'll be looking for creative industry tenants, but we're going to be absolutely categorical to rent space here. We only want to work with organisations uh, that are genuinely on the same page as us, wanting to diversify their workforces, wanting to make the creative industries fairer. So we want businesses who will offer apprenticeships, offer traineeships, constructively engage with us as a charity, with all of our partner agencies, and with the young people who really are driving this project every step of the way. Uh, that's what's going to make this project a success, and that's, that's what we absolutely can't compromise on. Ujima 98 FM, the real sound of Bristol. I didn't ask you, and what I meant to ask you at the beginning, are you actually being involved in what the building's actually going to look like? So obviously it's being led by the Creative Youth Network, but we are working with the different partners. Purcell Architects, we're working with Faithful and Gold Project Managers and the Interaction Interior Designers. So we're all clubbing together. We've been on a couple of trips around Bristol, London, all over the country, basically, to have a look at similar businesses with the interior designers as well. We've really been involved with every step of the process. Having uh, like live events and shows in there like very frequently be really cool and get more of Bristol society engaged with, with, with the place as well. And as I said as well about how to uh, get businesses involved in it as well, actually make a part of like the economic economic outset of Bristol as well. Be, really quite amazing, like literally just generating it into a, a, a brilliant hub of uh, real innovation, creativity and intrigue and networking, I think would just be really quite amazing, yeah, yeah. So basically for people to enjoy it, so basically get people showing them in and stuff and like, you know, basically if someone goes in there and they don't like it and stuff like that, then it's not good, you know what I mean? It's also make people feel welcoming. I think it would be great for the youth of Bristol to be able to have somewhere to go um, that they can feel safe, uh, included and looked after. And the course is here to offer means by which they can actually develop themselves through uh, tutoring, through um, different facilities that link these people with industry and uh, give them the indus industry contacts that they need to be able to develop themselves in the future. I also see like the space as like a creative hub for like businesses to give back to the community as well. It could be like with talks, like like uh, classes to teach people, or it could be like it just it doesn't just have to be like um like apprenticeships. It could be like um one-off things as well, like uh maybe like exhibits or things like that. It's going to become such a creative hub, inclusive, diverse area. It has this undivided focus on young creatives and bringing them into a professional space. I don't really think that's something I personally have been able to find elsewhere and even in Bristol where there is so much to experience um, in the creative scene I still felt myself fall in that gap between study and work and I think the courts 
will be that place. Just quite a welcoming space. I don't find Bristol Museum like the most welcoming space just because of its past and just because um, yeah, I just think it's just there's a lot of history within that and just it feels very formal as a building. I think that's just the way it's built and that is part of history but I think that I would want to make it really welcoming and a space that like anyone feels like they can come to. So I think that's what I took away, whereas Emshed feels like you can just walk in there at any time of the day and just like, kind of do whatever and I really like that kind of experience. We're all very passionate about this project and wanting to sort of use our skills that we'd already had or try and learn new skills and try and learn different things from different people. Um, I think I've definitely enjoyed learning about the history of the course because I genuinely had no idea about any of it. I just thought it was an old building. I really didn't know much. I just knew you could go clubbing and that's all I really knew <laughs> that you could do that. So I really enjoyed that. Being involved in the decision making is, has been really great and has been an amazing opportunity to see the behind the scenes of um, a project from the beginning to well, we'll hopefully see it through to the end. The young creatives of Bristol coming together is a really fantastic opportunity and it's something I'm really proud to be a part of. Um, as part of the project, I've been doing a bit of writing, which CYN have supported and promoted on their website, which has been really lush. I think there's a few opportunities there that wouldn't have been trusted with otherwise, perhaps, at my early, early career stage. An important part of the steering project for me has been being able to network myself and being able to um, open new opportunities for me in the future by talking to a Ujima radio station and networking myself as an artist for the future. I definitely enjoyed like getting to know everyone and kind of seeing in the like, youth steering group and seeing everyone's like skills. We're all bringing in like doing the documentary, getting to speak to different people within CYM, but then people outside who like um, have different inputs. So I get to enjoy the sense of like, community that we've had. I think having the courts would be a really key message to the people of Bristol. The idea that it's a repurposed building, it's a long-standing building, and the people that have been involved, just everyday young people and staff who are really just passionate about supporting each other and supporting the creative youth and creative young minds, basically. So for me, like personally, like I would like somewhere like open, like quiet, where you could work on things that's not in your house. If you're doing like exams, you have somewhere else to go. Or if you have like a project you're working on, you have somewhere to go. And it's right in the centre of town as well. So if you live nearby or um, you finish school, it's somewhere to go until you like, go home. To have such a stunning building as this in the centre of a city built into a creative hub is a golden opportunity for any city and I think uh, it shouldn't be sniffed at really. To have young artists work alongside experienced professionals in one space like this is just a goal. In all ways the younger generation are a lot more inspiring than they've been previously than, than my generation were when we were young. <laughs> uh, so I'd be really, I'm sort of interested to see what the alternative looks like. Welcome to a new beginning, to a space that creates space. You said that the artists capture the beauty of the city, the poets capture the soul. But what is a soul without opportunity? Freedom to express and grow. We welcome you with loving arms through a building laced with history. Stories hide deep between the cracks, but the court continues to smile with mystery. We're changing the narrative from the court's bleak past, washing away the smoke-stained brick to rewrite history at last. Walk with us and witness these changes as we imagine the new chapter and turn the pages.